right. We appreciate the service so far. We'd like to ask you please to open the Bible to Ezekiel chapter number 15. Ezekiel chapter 15. And we had alluded to this morning that uh, I didn't expect to be too very lengthy and long-winded tonight. We're going to try to hold true to that. Uh, we do need to have a business meeting after the service. So if you'll turn with me please to Ezekiel chapter 15. I'd like to take a couple of minutes just to read the whole chapter. It's only eight verses. So when you find your place, if you would, we'll stand in reverence of the reading of God's Word here tonight. Ezekiel chapter 15 and verse number 1 says these words. And the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, what is the vine tree more than any tree, or than a branch which is among the trees of the forest? Shall wood be taken thereof to do any work? Or will men take a pen of it to hang any vessel thereon? Behold, it is cast into the fire for fuel, the fire devoureth both the ends of it and the midst of it is burned. Is it meat for any work? Behold, when it was whole, it was meat for no work. How much less shall it be meat yet for any work when the fire hath devoured it and it is burned? Therefore thus saith the Lord God, as the vine tree among the trees of the forest which I have given to the fire for fuel, so will I give the inhabitants of Jerusalem. And I will set my face against them. They shall go out from one fire, and another fire shall devour them. And ye shall know that I am the Lord when I set my face against them. And I will make the land desolate, because they have committed a trespass saith the Lord God. God bless the reading of His Word. You may be seated in the presence of God here tonight. I'm glad God forgives all of our sins. Amen. Amen. I'm glad God forgives our iniquities. Amen. I'm glad God forgives our trespasses. I'm thankful there's grace and mercy in God enough to wash our sins away and to cleanse our lives and to make us new creatures. This is available by God's grace to whosoever will call upon the name of the Lord. So I just want to begin this message tonight by praising God for the fact that He is a merciful God who forgives our sins. Amen. I don't know about you, but I've had a great many a sin in my life that I needed God to forgive me uh, for those sins, and I'm glad to tell you that He has. Yes. And He's able to forgive you as well. I'm glad that God has redeemed my life yes. from destruction. I was on a pathway to a devil's hell. Lost, broken, undone without Jesus Christ. I did not acknowledge the Lordship of Christ in my life. I lived in this world. I lived for self. But God redeemed my life from destruction. I'm glad that He's crowned me with loving kindness and tender mercy. And let me just say this tonight before we go any further. If the Word does not come, then we can't preach. If God does not send the Word, no man can preach, no man can teach. If the Word doesn't come, we'd be better off just to sit down. Because if God doesn't send the words, any words that I might say in and of myself, they would mean nothing. They would be nothing more than a sounding brass and a tinkling cymbal. But thank God, God is able to send the Word. And when God sends a Word, I don't know about you, but I think we ought to give an ear and hear it, don't you? As I thought about these verses tonight, I thought about how that you and I, as individual human beings, men and women created in the image of God, how that in and of ourselves we have no power, we have no might, we are weak in and of ourselves. We are weak. We need God. We need God to give us strength. We need God's grace day by day in this life. We need God. I, I don't want to walk another moment in my life without Jesus. I need Him each and every day of my life. I've already been down that sinful road. 
I've already been down that pathway, the broad path that leads to destruction. I need Jesus and I want Him in my life. We have no power in and of ourselves. The only power that we can have in our lives is the power that God gives us. And without the Lord Jesus Christ, we're totally helpless. And it makes no difference tonight if you're saved, if you're lost, if you're heaven bound, if you're hell bound, whatsoever state you're in, without the Lord Jesus Christ giving you grace and air to breathe and food to eat and water to drink, and giving you your daily sustenance to live in this world, we are totally helpless. Without Christ, we are like a, a little child with no mother, with no father to take care of it. We need the help and the power of God inside of our lives. You know, even the devil only has the power that God gives him. That's, right. that's, the, that's the only power that the devil has. The devil's not almighty. The devil's not all-powerful. He only has the power that God allows him to have. The devil is subject to God. They're not equal. God's way up here and the devil's way down here. God allows the devil to have what little bit of power he has. And Satan, I'm glad, but I, I, I'm going to tell you tonight, Satan is not all-powerful. God is the only one who's all-powerful. He's the only all-powerful force in this universe. The devil answers to God. The devil gives account to the Lord. And that's something that you and I can rejoice in tonight. As we look here in the Word of God, Israel had gotten to the place where they had once again turned their backs on God. And the Bible says they had trespassed grievously. And God was about to wipe them out. God was about to destroy these people. And in verses 2 and 3, God compares them to a vine tree. Verse number 2 says, Son of man, what is a vine tree more than any tree? Or than a branch which is among the trees of the forest? Shall wood be taken thereof to do any work? Or will men take a pen of it to hang any vessel thereon? I got to studying on a vine tree. And I discovered that a vine tree is weak and brittle. That's what it is. Compared to other trees, compared to other lumber, a vine tree is weak and brittle. It's bendable. It's breakable. It's not as strong as these other trees. It's not even strong enough to make a peg out of it to hang your hat on or anything else. That's a vine tree. And as I thought about that vine tree and how weak and brittle it is. I got to thinking about how this is like the one who depends on himself to get himself through the cares of this life. This is like the one who lives his life day by day, never giving a second thought to God, never giving a second thought to the Lord Jesus Christ, never giving a second thought to God's church, and he goes through his life day by day depending upon himself. Weak and brittle. This is like the one who tries to do good works to merit their salvation. I'm telling you tonight, my dear friends, without the Lord Jesus Christ in your life, all the good works you can ever do in and of yourself will not amount to a hill of beans. You need Jesus. Amen. We're not saved by our good works. You need Jesus Christ. That's what Brother Quentin talked about in Sunday school this morning. Good works come from a heart that adores God. A heart that desires to glorify the Lord Jesus Christ. They do not save you. You'll never be able to earn your salvation by being a good person. It comes by grace through faith in Christ. And then when you're saved, you acknowledge the Lordship of Christ inside of your life. That's what saved people do. They don't reject and deny Christ and disobey the Word of God. No, they honor the Word of God. And they acknowledge the Lordship of Jesus Christ. You cannot earn your salvation. It takes the gracious Lord who is above all creation. The Bible says, What is man that thou art mindful of him? Or the son of man whom thou visited? Thou hast made him a little lower than the angels and crowned him with suffering and death that he may taste death for every man. I'm glad to know that Jesus Christ is exalted high above the heavens. He's been given a name that's above every name. 
that at the name of Jesus Christ every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess that He is the Lord to the glory of God the Father. You can't work your way in. And even if you're saved by the grace of God, the works that you do for yourself, they're going to be counted as wood, hay, and stubble. They're going to be burned up. But Israel, here in the Bible, Israel, here in Ezekiel chapter 15, they did not have the power of the Lord. The power of the Lord was lacking in their existence. They were double-minded. They were unstable in all of their ways. They were tossed to and fro. We see this pattern all throughout the Old Testament. They're following after God in one part, then they reject God and turn away from Him to follow after some false God, and then they'll turn back to God and then they'll reject God and, and the cycle just continues throughout the Old Testament. Double-minded, unstable. Maybe there's some folks here tonight, you've tried everything in this world that you could possibly think of. You've tried to do better. You've tried to turn over a new leaf, but you can't do it alone. It takes the power of God. Amen. It takes the blood of the Lamb. It takes the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. It takes His cleansing power. It takes His mercy, love, and grace. It takes Christ. You see, there was a time in my life when if somebody invited me to come to church, and this is a true story, this is just a little bit of my testimony tonight, there was a time in my life when if somebody invited me to come to church, do you know what I'd tell them? Well, I can't come until I quit cussing. I can't come until I quit doing this sin or that sin. I've got to clean my life up. And then when I get my life cleaned up, then I'll come to church. That was my response. Oh, I've got to stop all this sinning. But you see, my problem was I had it exactly backwards. It was backwards. A man cannot clean himself up. Jesus Christ is the one who does the cleaning. The Bible said that He came not to call the righteous man but He came to call sinners Amen. to repentance. For the whole need not a physician, but the sick, they're the ones who need a physician. Christ came to call sinners to repentance. And that was me. And that was you. If you're sitting here saved by the grace of God, you are a sinner that Christ called to repentance. And it took Jesus. I'm so glad that God finally brought me to the place in my life where I began to realize that cleaning myself up was out of my hands. God finally brought me to the place where I began to realize that cleaning myself up was impossible with me. I couldn't do it. And much like the woman with the issue of blood in the Word of God, I had to get to Jesus. I had to get to Him. The Bible said that she tried everything. She tried all that she could think of. She spent her money on doctors and physicians. She spent all that she had, the Bible said. But finally, after being none the better, by seeking after all of these doctors and all of these physicians, she made up her mind, I've got to get to Him. I've got to get to Jesus Christ. I need to get Him. Even if it means getting down on my hands and knees and crawling through a great mob of people, she thought to herself, if I could just get close enough to the Lord to reach out and but just touch the hem of His garment, if I can just do that much, I know it will be alright. And when she reached out and touched the hem of His garment, Jesus turned, the Bible said, and, I, and said, I perceive that virtue has gone out of me. I sure thank God for the day in my life in late July 2001 when virtue left heaven. Jesus Christ passed by and I reached out and touched Him and He saved my dying soul and it wasn't because of my goodness. It wasn't because of my works. It wasn't because of anything that I've done. It was because Jesus passed by and washed my sins away. Verse 4, Behold, it is cast into the fire for fuel. The fire devoureth both the ends of it, and the midst of it is burned. 
Is it meat for any work? Behold, when it was whole, it was meat for no work. How much less shall it be meat yet for any work when the fire hath devoured it and it is burned? Without Jesus Christ, hell is our destiny. A lot of folks don't want to hear that today, but it's true. Yeah, it's Jesus true. Christ said in John chapter 15, verse number 6, He said, If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered. And men gather them and cast them into the fire and they are burned. God said here that even the vine tree, even when it was whole, it still wasn't fit for anything. And once it's burned, it's going to be fit for even less. Now, I don't know about you, but I still believe that hell was a real place. We don't hear that preached in a lot of pulpits in America today because the flesh doesn't want to hear that. But it's, it's true and it's... it's part of the whole counsel of the Word of God and we have to declare that. I believe hell is a real place today. Yeah. It is a place of weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth where the worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. And I believe there will be a lot of people who will die and go to that awful place and they won't be able to come back and beg the Lord for a second chance because when you die and you go there, you'll be there forever. There's no coming back. We need to remember those who die without Jesus spend an eternity separated from the presence of God. I wasn't planning on going here, but I'd like to flip over to Luke chapter 16, please. Luke chapter 16, verse number 19. Luke 16 and verse 19. There was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus which was laid at his gate full of sores and desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. And it, shall come, and it came to pass that after the... Excuse me. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And in hell he lift up his eyes, being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things, and Lazarus evil things, but now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. And beside all this, between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed, so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot, neither can they pass to us that would come out from thence. Those who die without Jesus Christ spend their eternity separated from the presence of God. And I've been around long enough to know, because I've, I've done a lot of study on Luke chapter 16 and some other verses that pertain to hell. And you could go on Google and find a whole lot of uh, different ideals circulating. You could hear the Jehovah's Witnesses' perspective, annihilationism, and I've debated with them. But I want to tell you, church, I'm not a revisionist pastor. I believe hell is a real place. Yes. I believe what the Bible has to say about this place called hell is uh, information that we need to heed to. And you know what? That's the orthodox Christian perspective on this. This is what the church, not the cults, but this is what the church has believed for 2,000 years. Yep. This is what the church has believed for 2,000 years. We need to be mindful of this. But God said that Jerusalem was like a vine tree. It was only good for one thing, and that was to be burned. Why? Because they didn't have the Lord. They had turned their backs on Him. They had acted treacherously. 
And verse number 6, back in Ezekiel chapter 15, says, Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, as the vine tree among the trees of the forest, which I have given to the fire for fuel, so will I give the inhabitants of Jerusalem. Someone might be asking tonight, well, what does this have to do with me? All of this is Old Testament, Pastor. What does this have to do with me? He's talking to the Jews here. Well, I know the Word of God says that after faith comes, we're no longer under a schoolmaster, but this is a good example of people who try to go through this life without ever trusting God. This is a picture of what it looks like. They try to live life their own way. They try to live life according to their own power. And they never submit their lives to Christ. The simple truth tonight is this. You're either saved or you're lost. There's no gray area there. You're either saved and you live for God and you acknowledge the Lordship of Christ inside of your life and you submit to the Lordship of Christ or you're lost. There's only two types of people in this world. You're either one or the other. You can't be both at the same time. You cannot be somewhere in between. You cannot straddle the fence. You cannot be lukewarm. You're either hot or cold. Jesus said in the book of Revelation, if you're lukewarm, I'll spew you out of my mouth. The saved will go on and be with the Lord while the lost will die and suffer eternally in a lake of fire. There's a strange new teaching that's been going around that I've heard about where people are saying it's possible to be saved and yet not be born again. I don't believe that. Salvation and being born again are synonymous. Saved and being born again are the same thing. They're just trying to teach that everybody's going to be saved, but somehow a group called born again will be a select few of those who are already saved. That's universalism, that everybody's going to heaven. That's not what the Bible teaches. There's some people that ain't going. Not everybody's saved. Not everyone's going to be saved. There's many who are lost. There's many who will die lost. That's why we need to be pleading for souls. That's why we need to be preaching the gospel. That's why we need to be sowing the good seed. But people today, they just don't want to believe in a literal fiery place called hell that's going to be cast into the lake of fire. But that day's coming and people will know then beyond the shadow of a doubt that Jesus Christ is Lord. But by then it will be too late to change that heart because the presence of God will not be found in the lake of fire. It holds eternal separation from God. Verse number 8. And I will make the land desolate because they have committed a trespass saith the Lord God. Life without Jesus, I want to be clear, is desolate. Life without Jesus Christ is empty. Life without Jesus Christ is void of hope and joy and love, true love. For one to die without Jesus Christ is to die having an abundance of nothing in the life to come except pain, and sorrow and agony and sadness. That's a life without Christ. Unless the Lord takes us home, death is coming. Hebrews chapter 9, verse number 27 plainly says, And as it is appointed unto men once to die, and after this the judgment, but for those who are saved by God's grace, blessed are they who die in the Lord. With Jesus Christ we have strength. Amen? Well, we've got a lot of good news to talk about tonight. I'm going to John chapter 15. We're going to close this out with some good news. We've heard all about hell, but there's hope. Jesus said this in John chapter 15. He said, I am the true vine, and my Father is the husband with the gardener. With a farmer, I guess we might say. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away, and every branch 
that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself except it abide in the vine, no more can ye except ye abide in me. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without, for without me ye can do nothing. Amen. The vine tree that is Jerusalem in Ezekiel chapter number 15. It may have been weak. It may have been brittle. But the true vine of John chapter 15 is very, very strong. The true vine is very, very powerful. And in Him we can be vessels of honor, sanctified and meet for the Master's use. We don't have life until we abide in Him and it's not until we accept Him that we have spiritual life. He gives us of His power and we can do all things through Christ which strengthens us. He gives us power to overcome the enemy. He gives us power to overcome the temptations of the devil. We all face temptations in our lives. Even Jesus Christ Himself faced temptations in Matthew chapter 4. It's not a sin to be tempted, but the sin comes when you yield to that temptation, when God will give you the strength to withstand the temptations of the devil. 1 Corinthians 10, 13. There hath no temptation taken you, but such is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you are able, but who will with the temptation also make a way to escape that you might be able to bear the Bible describes Israel in Hosea chapter 10 as being the empty vine that brings forth fruit only to himself. But if the attributes of Jesus Christ abound in us, then the Bible says that we will neither be barren nor unfruitful. Amen? We can bear fruit for God and we can withstand the devil and know that no weapon formed against us shall prosper. So my question to you tonight is this. And I know it's been a short message, but here's my question to you tonight. Are you bearing fruit unto God? Or are you like the vine tree that God wanted to destroy here in Ezekiel chapter 15? He said it was good for nothing. He said the only thing it's good for is to be hewn down and cast into the fire. And I don't know your heart tonight, but God does. And there's one thing that I do know. If you're saved tonight, God didn't save you to do nothing. God saved you to work in His vineyard. God saved you to bring Him glory. God saved you to honor Christ and submit to His Lordship. And God wants faithful workers in the vineyard who are making full proof of their ministry is that you tonight, my dear friend? Or are you weak and brittle like the vine tree? I don't know your heart, but God does. And I would say to you tonight, my dear friend, if you need God, if you're here tonight and you know beyond the shadow of a doubt that you need a touch from above, that you need God to do a work in your life, because the Spirit of God has spoken to your heart from the Word of God tonight and He's began to open your eyes and to open that heart and to open those ears to the Gospel. And God has given the increase in your life right now. We've got an altar right here, my dear friend. I encourage you to come. If you've got burdens, you can lay them down. If you have needs in your life, you can come and talk to Him. God's able to give you what you need in this very service that we're in right now. But you've got to trust Him. Turn aside from yourself and turn to Christ. Repent and believe the gospel. For those of you who are saved by the grace of God, keep on trucking for Jesus. Don't look back. There, there's no stopping point in this journey, in this Christian life. This life is about to ramp up. You just keep going on for Jesus. Be encouraged. 
Let the Word of God encourage and strengthen your heart. And when you hear hard messages about hell like we heard tonight, be encouraged that you're not going there. <laughs> Let that be a strength and a blessing inside of your life. I don't know what's needed here tonight, but the Lord does, and I'm going to trust Him. Would you pray with me? Father in heaven, we come in the name of Jesus tonight. Lord, we've done our best to preach what you'd have us to preach in this place. And I pray, God, that you'll give the increase according to your will. Meet needs tonight, God, for your glory. God, we'll praise you and we'll thank you. Maybe somebody here tonight's never been saved. Maybe they